Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show, the James Spinner Show podcast, presented to you by MacHard, MacHard Anderson and Associates, PLLC. How are we doing? Hope everyone's doing fantastic here in this dystopian nightmare that we call reality, and welcome to the show. I have like 16 different cameras going right now, so we're going to see just how many technical difficulties are going to fit into one show. We've got a DSLR going over here, we've got a webcam going on, we've got... It's a, it's all over the place. So we're going to try and do this and see what works. There's no telling what will get published. But as long as something is published, I am happy. Today on the show, we have a lot of stuff going on. So I'm not going to waste your time with uh, some housekeeping. Like always, if you enjoy the show, if you're new to the show, all that fun stuff, uh, rate, review, subscribe, follow, all the fun tings. And on social media, I'm always available at James underscore Scrametta, Twitter and Instagram. I found like a new love of Twitter recently. I've been, I've been tweeting a lot. I went on like a 10 month hiatus where Twitter was just the worst place in the world. But I'm, I'm starting to fall back in love with it. I'm starting to fall back in love with the, with the original uh, real social media platform. Twitter at one point was the greatest thing ever. And then they got lost in the sauce. And so Twitter, Twitter's okay. Twitter's all right right now. I've been using it uh, more now than, than I have in a long time. So, uh, yeah, I've been active on there. Today, let's get right into it, huh? We got some we got some coronavirus talk. We got some baseball. We got some Joe Rogan. We've got all kinds of stuff. All kinds of demon sperm. And that's not even a joke. We will get into demon sperm. The first thing I do want to talk about, though, is this Joe Rogan thing. This This exploded over the weekend. So, Joe Rogan... You know, free thinker, fellow podcaster, fellow media magnate like myself. Uh, Joe Rogan kind of kind of went out on a limb here. Let me get his direct quote. So Joe Rogan was uh, talking with fitness guru Joe Desanya, and they were talking about you know video games and and children who turn to video games when they have no uh, role models in their lives or whatever. And Joe says is a direct quote. They just fucking lay around, you know, yeah. and then they, they seek refuge in drugs or video games or something that stimulates them. And video games are a real problem. They're a real problem. You know why? Because they're fucking fun. Addictive. And you don't. Yeah. Well, I'm, I have a real problem with them. And you 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 do them and they're real exciting, but you don't get anywhere. Right. It's like you could do like like martial arts. Right. You could learn jujitsu. You get obsessed by jujitsu, and then three years later, you're you're like an elite jujitsu athlete. You're like you're entering in competitions. You're a purple belt. You're moving up. Yeah, you're doing well. Right. You're thinking like I might be able to open my own school one you day. Got confidence. Yeah, if I have a hundred students and those hundred students are paying me X amount of dollars per month, I can make a living. Holy shit, I can have a. This would be amazing. And then you see your jujitsu school, and your jujitsu instructor has all these students and drives a Mercedes, and he's got a nice family, and like that's the future. This way you're doing something exciting and fun and you don't or you could just be playing fucking video games three years later you could be that same kid just playing video games waiting for the next this whatever the fuck game is you know next xbox game to come out and you're gonna waste your time but there are kids that make a lot of fucking money right, playing video games. games but the thing is like you have to be adaptable you have to be able to play multiple video games because the one video game that you get really good at, what are the odds that's going to be around five years from now? Right. This is one of those things that I think a lot of people, like a lot of people went in on this. A lot of people got involved with this. A lot of people really, really were mad one way or the other. And I think they were all kind of missing the point. So I'll, I'll touch on a few parts of this. So I think that what he's saying about video games, or what he's saying about really anything, is that, look, if you're just sitting around, wasting your time, doing something for hours and hours and hours, and you're not getting anything out of it, and there's no real reason to be doing it, is that good? No. It's obviously not good. And it doesn't have to be video games. Video games, in this example, is what he used. But, you know, at the very, at the very beginning of coronavirus, we talked about the problems with Netflix and the problems with the idea of people like, oh, hell yeah, I'm working remote. And we warned, hey, do not let yourself get into a situation where you're watching 10, 12, 14 hours of Netflix a day, right? And that comes with anything. That comes with anything. 
If you're just pouring time and you're just pouring energy and resources into something and it's just a flat waste, then it, it is bad, right? Now, something else I really want, and then of course you had the video game people come out and the video game people were talking about how, look, and it's kind of funny because you have like Ninja and people like that coming out and they're saying, hey, whoa, look what video games did for me. It sounds like he's talking about like the top 1% or like the very odd or one-off chance that you're going to be a professional player and esports player and a successful one at that, right? I mean, you can be a professional esports player and, you know, beyond like a tier two, tier three org, which is not maybe paying you the most. And obviously if you're not winning and being paid a lot you're, and you're not a big streamer, then you're not really making a lot of money. Uh, so I'm assuming he's just basically talking about, you know, the top 1%, you're winning every tournament, you're on a top organization, you're, you're, you're making a shitload of money, you're successful. And I mean, you know, he talks about how, you know, gaming can potentially not really get you anywhere, right? You're putting a lot of time into it and you're just mindlessly playing video games. I just don't think what Joe, Joe doesn't really understand in the full context of what the gaming community is and, and how many different avenues you can be successful in in gaming. Uh, I mean, there's streaming, just content creation, YouTube, uh, you know, being a professional player, being a freaking coach i mean like you don't like coach, like you can be incredibly understanding of a game but not have the physical capacity to be able to you know get pentakills uh every single round and you know every single game but that doesn't mean that you know there's not a job for you right that doesn't mean there's not a place for you in the gaming community where you can be successful uh especially when you know coaches are being valued more and more in the gaming community now which is a beautiful thing to see because coaches have been in sports forever um so i mean i'd love to go on and talk about it more but I think that uh, if you guys are in the gaming scene, we all know there are so many different ways you can be successful. There are so many different ways that you can make a living out of it. So it's like, well, that's not fair either. Like you can't, you can't take Ninja and be like, well, look at this. Look at what video games did for Ninja. He he signed a thirty million dollar deal, and it's like, well, that's not. You also don't want to tell kids that, right? You don't also want to tell kids like, hey, if you play video games a lot, you can be like Ninja and make. Tens of millions of dollars. You don't want to take the one or the point zero 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 one percent and make that the example. You also don't want to take the opposite side of the person who just wastes their life or whatever. And part of the what he was saying that I thought was interesting was that he was basically saying, or it kind of came off as, be careful with a hobby and try and choose a hobby that you can monetize or choose a hobby that you can you know, turn into money and stuff like that and get something out of it. And this is something that's really recent, this idea, this phenomenon. When I was younger, you know, you think and I was a kid, so it is a little different, but I think he's generally talking to kids about the video game thing. You know, I would spend a lot of time just like, whatever, playing outside or uh, playing with my action figures or wrestling action figures or whatever. And there was no game. There was no real... There was no real purpose to it. It was just kind of me playing or me having like a hobby or something. And now, with the dawn of streaming and YouTube and, and all that, I think people get in this trap where they try and monetize everything. And I know personally, for me, I've done this. And I have to, I have to try and reel myself in because as a creator, as someone who just wants to create, if I do almost anything, one of my first thoughts is, Okay, well, I have to make a video about this. I have to make a podcast about this. I have to make tweet about this. I have to do a review on this. I have to do a preview on this. I have to, you know, I have to do a hashtag. I have to do this. I have to make a thumbnail. And if you fall into that trap, you won't enjoy anything. You won't have any hobbies. You'll just have like these weird little side projects. And a lot of the times with those weird little side projects is if people get into them for the wrong reasons, then you know, you'll see a lot of people start something like a blog or a movie reviews or book reviews and they'll just quit. And they may look like a quitter, but they really might have just fell out of the hobby, you know. And I have had to make concerted efforts to say, I'm just going to watch this movie or I'm just going to play this video game or I'm just going to whatever, go for a run on the beach. And I'm not going to document it. I'm not going to review it. I'm not going to make a video. And because sometimes I just need like a refresher. I just need a moment to myself. So I think 
the, uh, the younger generation who are super involved in the idea of live streaming and capturing video content and writing blogs and doing stuff like that, part of me is nervous that they're going to attempt to monetize everything. And they're just going to be following this weird trend of, oh, I'll do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and I'll document my journey the entire way and I'll make Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu videos and I'll do a you know a Instagram stuff. And, and it's just like, man... I don't know if that's the right way to go about a hobby either. You sh- you should just kind of do a hobby. And um, I mean, it, that's that's one of those things that is so new. There's no telling the ramifications of this. And I I know some people who do not create. Some people my age who do not create. They have nothing to. They they wouldn't know a Twitch stream from a YouTube video, from a webcam, from a microphone. They they don't care. And I always think it's really interesting that they had that mindset of like, oh, I'm just going to watch this movie. And they really don't even think about it. But then you see creators or you see people who are younger and it's the complete opposite. So I would offer quite the warning uh, on both sides of this. Yes, um, you know, dumping a lot of time and stuff into something fruitless can be bad or time-wasting. On the flip side, sometimes I think time wasting is okay. You know, not everything has to have a reason. Not everything has to have purpose. You know, I mean, we've seen more puzzles or probably completed this coronavirus than ever before. And I wouldn't call puzzles like this huge, you know, fulfilling time thing. Uh, even you know, reading books, you could argue it's like, oh, well, you're getting smarter, you're doing this. But if you get on that rabbit hole, you can do the same thing with video games. You know, video games obviously are a big part of of my childhood and my life now. And, and I can honestly say that it's a release. Uh, it, it boosts your creativity, your imagination. And also now with, with how social everything is, it's a great way to make friends. It's a great way to um, you know keep in touch with friends. I have plenty of friends who 90% of our conversations are during or about a video game. And I haven't seen them in years. And it's nice to catch up. It's nice to have, talk about you know these things together. So... Like anything, I think this got blown way out of proportion, but I, I, w- I would I would uh, I would caution both sides of this particular argument. Joe Rogan has been catching a lot of flack. I think it's kind of interesting. Joe Rogan is kind of like at one point was everybody's daddy, and now he's everybody's crazy uncle. I don't, I don't know. It's kind of interesting. I, I love Joe Rogan. I th- I listen to his podcast. I'm a huge fan. I like the idea of open thinking and critical you know like i like i like what he does i think his platform is super important because it gave a voice to a lot of cool stuff and I, you know you see a lot of people who picked up jujitsu and picked up archery and picked up whatever because of joe rogan and uh, i i think it, we've talked about it on the podcast i think it ushered in a new era of for men for sure i mean i, I can't really speak about speak about it on the women's side of things because i don't i don't personally know any women that listen to joe rogan so i I have no idea. I'm sure there are, but I don't. I can't speak on it. But as far as for males, I think it has definitely offered men this interesting look into like, oh, well, I can, I can do this. I can do this kind of like this other thing. I, you know, whether it's archery, jujitsu, working out, eating healthy, trying new foods, trying new diets, whatever it is. Some guys do get pigeonholed into the direct clone, where it's like, hey, I'll do archery and jujitsu and smoke weed. It's like, ah, well. Some guys, you know, they kind of venture off and like, oh, maybe I want to do fly fishing or stand up paddle boarding or skateboarding or learn a language. And, you know, it's just, hey, the, the main thing is open your eyes a little bit, try new things, and see what happens. But yeah, man, Joe's been getting after it. Joe's been getting crazy. Let's talk about, oh, God. Do I want to get in on this? I guess so. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. So, so this fellow, let's, let's get into the coronavirus stuff, I guess. So this was sent to me. This was a Twitter video of a fella named uh, Charlie Kirk, I believe is his name. And apparently, yeah, Charlie Kirk. And apparently he's a pretty big voice in the youth conservative movement, which, whew, some wild words right there. So this guy's like a young, like a young Stephen Crowder, like a young Tucker Carlson kind of kind of guy. Uh, he's got a pretty Pretty big following. He's got like almost 2 million followers on Twitter. Uh, he's got a podcast. I guess he's got some shows or you know, speaking engagements. I don't know. But 
This was on my Twitter, and this is his response to people wearing the masks. The infamous anti, uh, anti-maskers. anti We've made multiple videos on this. And I'm going to play this young man's statement. It's about two minutes, and then we're going to talk about it. So get yourself ready. Here we go. Do not force me to wear a mask. It's that simple. I'm not going to do it. I'm not. The only time I comply is on the airlines because I actually need to fly the airlines to be able to do my job and travel the country so I can deliver truth to you and make an income and grow Turning Point USA. So that's the fight I do not fight. But every single time I go into one of these grocery stores, where's your mask? I say, well, first of all, the science around masks is very questionable, very questionable. In fact, some people, some doctors think that masks actually make you sicker and have you less likely to be able to get oxygen and more likely to infect yourself and less likely to be able to fight the virus and actually more likely to be able to die sooner. A lot of people believe that. I've met many doctors that hold that view. Secondly, we have a huge civil liberty issue here. Why do you have the authority to tell me what I can and cannot do with my body? I thought it was my body, my choice. I thought that was the entire thought process as to why we are wrongly able to terminate a million children in the womb every single year. And so I just don't like being told what to do generally by the federal government. I'm not a type of person who plays well when the government comes in and starts to say you must put this on your face. Now, I think there's some restrictions that I support. I'm actually in the minority. I support seatbelt laws because I think seatbelts actually save lives. And I actually think it's not that big of an infringement on your liberty. I kind of disagree with a lot of people on this. I mean, some super strict libertarians say, oh, no, no, seatbelts ever. Okay. If you fly through the window of a car because you didn't want to wear a seatbelt and all of a sudden I have to pay for your health care, that's ridiculous. A mask might not even work. A mask is questionable at best. So the, the science around masks is needs to be debated more. And the fact that these Republican governors are like, oh, you must wear a mask. You must wear a mask. I think it's nonsense. And I, I don't think it's popular. I have never met anyone that says, I just love wearing my mask. I love it. Yeah, I mean, okay. I am not a fan. I think it's dehumanizing. When I see a four-year-old wearing a mask, I can't think but help. We have let them down. And we have robbed them of their childhood. This was something else. I could not believe whenever I first saw this. I sent it to a bunch of people. This is like, this is what we've been saying the whole time with the mask. Is that it is identical to all the other, these other regulations that are put in place. When he describes the seatbelt seat belt situation and why he adheres to the seatbelt, that is a direct reason for why you should adhere to the masks. I would argue that the masks are less abrasive. I mean, the seatbelt is literally strapped across your chest and waist and holding you into place. I mean, you can't even get out of your seat with a seatbelt on. You can't even move. You can't do anything. With a mask, it's just on your face. It's not, it's not doing anything. It's not choking you. It's not... De, quote unquote dehumanizing you and then the idea this is another interesting peak the idea that oh well the seatbelt could save my life but the mask but the mask the difference is what does the mask do it's also important to understand the mask could save other people's lives or it involves other people the seatbelt is strictly unless you're flying out of the front of your windshield going through someone else's windshield, hitting them, or hitting someone walking on the street, the seatbelt is really a you thing. You know, the seatbelt is keeping you safe. The mask is not only keeping you safe, but it's also to try and keep other people safe. Now, is the seatbelt 100%? Is the seatbelt always going to save your life? No. I know a guy who was hit by a drunk driver. He was wearing a seatbelt, and he was saved. I mean, he didn't go flying through his car. No telling what would have happened. But he was also devastatingly injured by his seatbelt. His seatbelt like ripped up his entire stomach. He had to have multiple surgeries to try and repair the damage. And you know, the seat we see that all the time. Seatbelts or airbags or whatever injuring people. So they don't it's not like this one is a perfect thing. It's not like seatbelts are a hundred percent save rate. Seatbelts are the best thing of all time. It's just that he believes in the seatbelt, so they're okay. And this was one of those things where when you hear it, it just keeps reaffirming all the stuff that we say and we keep hearing and repeating and trying to drill into people's heads about the mask. Is that these ideas that the mask is dehumanizing or the mask is taking away a child's childhood, 
is pretty crazy. I mean, you talk about a stretch to think like, well, yeah, we're in like a global pandemic or whatever, and yeah, we're trying to get this thing over with, and would we, would we rather live in this half-in, half-out universe that we're currently in, or would we rather wear a mask for a few weeks or a month or whatever and get rid of this thing like we've seen in, in New Zealand? And people take that all the way to this is dehumanizing, this is taking away children's childhood. I mean, the steps that they're jumping for a mask is crazy. I have I know someone who openly says I'm not wearing a mask, and they openly say stuff like this about how the mask is taking away their freedom, the mask is just propaganda, the mask is dehumanizing, whatever. And the, the same person, you know, drives the speed limit, and the same person wears seatbelts, and the same person adheres to every other structure placed by government, every other thing possible, good to go. The only thing that they believe is infringing on them is a mask. It's crazy. I just don't understand. I, I'm cool. I'm all for somebody who's like, I'm not wearing a mask. I'm not driving the speed limit. I'm not wearing a seatbelt. I'm not doing nothing. I'm not doing anything anybody says. I'm a free, free wielding, you know, free wielding bad boy out here. I'm doing me. I only care about what I'm doing. Not interested in the government. Not interested in that. If that's your, if that's you. And you're, you know, checking the same way on all the boxes. Hey, you got to just respect that. But I do not get it, man. I do not understand this. I, I'm not wearing a mask, but I'll gladly adhere to literally every other guideline you have. And we talked about going on a plane. If you've gone on a plane recently, there's so many things put into place to keep people safe with the plane. Even on a plane. You know, you can't get up. You gotta wear a seatbelt during this time of the flight. You gotta do this during this time of the flight. You have to adhere to all these guidelines. And it's like, hey man, why do you do that? It's like, well, you know, they're they're there to keep us safe. Okay, well, do you see what's happening here? Do you see what's going on? And it's not like we're microchipping you. If this was a microchip, or if this was I'm forcing you to take a vaccine, that's a whole different story. We're talking about wearing a mask, a Medical mask. It's not like a, a helmet. A mask. Briefly, while you're in public spaces. Not when you're at home. Not, not you know, in those situations. Just when you're out about in public areas. Is it that difficult? Are we still doing this? And this is someone who, this, that, the, what I just showed you has a million views. A million views. I'm sure there's tons more of this out there. And this guy's directly influencing, quote unquote, Youth conservatives, and this guy has a huge following who's listening to this rhetoric, and they're saying, "Yeah, I'm not wearing a stupid mask. I'm not doing what the government tells me to do. I'm doing whatever the hell I want to do." And then what are we going to do in two months when we're in the exact same situation and we're still kind of half in, half out? I don't know. I guess at least we have our freedom. At least we have our freedom. Speaking of freedom, speaking of coronavirus, can we talk about the demon doctor? So this was something else that was sent to me. So this is one of the doctors. This lady's name is Dr. Stella Emanuel. And she is uh, one of the doctors who is, you know, a COVID-19 doctor, if you will. And she was talking about the drug hydroxychloroquine, which we've heard in the news over and over and over again. She talks about how it does cure coronavirus, whatever. Not interested in that. We're going to skip that part. I'm not a doctor. I'm not interested in it. We're going to skip that. What I am going to talk about is she mentioned, and this somehow has gotten lost in the sauce, but she mentioned that in the past that some gynecological ailments are caused by people having sex in a dream world with demons, with demonic semen as the origins of the afflictions. Now look, I understand that we're in a situation where, you know, people want to cure COVID. But we have a doctor who is telling you that some ailments are the cause are caused by having sex with demons and astral walkers in some kind of dream world. 
If you told me that there's two doors, door one is the cure to the coronavirus, and door two, I could have the answers to this astral walking demon sex situation, I'm going to go check out what's going on in the demon sex astral situation. The more we hear about aliens and the more we hear about, you know, uh, Tom Hanks fleeing to Greece to you know, keep his reptilian pedophile, uh, you know, we, 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 won't, we won't get into that. But the more we hear about these things that are always just kind of like hush-hush and now they're all coming out as true, like aliens, when you hear something that's like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, demon semen... Uh, you know, causes tumors and stuff and, and whatever. Don't, don't worry about that. Anything, anyways, more about this uh, hydroxychloroquine. It's like, well, wait a minute. What did you just say about the demon sex? And, you know, this is, this is the world we live in, where it sounds like the Inquirer. This is like the direct headline from an Inquirer magazine that I would see in the grocery store. Like right underneath the Bat Boy story, Right underneath where we talk about Bat Boy being seen in New York is where you see, like, demon semen causes uh, uterus cancer or something. And this is a doctor. This is someone who's out in the public. This is someone who's treating people. This is someone who is trying to cure COVID. And they simultaneously have dealt with demon semen. I mean, demon semen sounds like a bad Ozzy Osbourne album. This same doctor, this same doctor claimed that if she was not given her Twitter account back, then Jesus would come down and strike whoever took her Twitter account away or her Facebook account away until she got it back. And people are destroying this woman, obviously, and saying she's a fraud, she's crazy, she's nuts, she, she should be disbarred, whatever. You know, she, she, She's given demons a bad name, all that stuff. And I would like to remind you that we have someone running for the president of the United States who's being heralded as a genius in Kanye West, who just recently said a lot of the same stuff. Kanye West just recently said that God himself intervened when Kanye was going to kill his daughter. God himself intervened to, and while he was designing his shoes. God intervened. And said, if you mess with my plan, I'm gonna, or if you mess with my vision, I'm going to mess with yours. And Kanye decided to have the daughter. My, oh my, oh my, who we call crazy. My, oh my, oh my, who we disbar. I got a sneaky feeling. Not a lot of people are going to be lining up to get their, you know, to get their OBGYN appointments with this doctor. But I have a feeling a lot of people are going to be pre-ordering, pre-ordering Kanye's next album. Interesting who we call crazy and who we call genius. Interesting the intersection of believable and non-believable. Isn't it interesting who we completely eliminate versus who we stand? Something to think about, ladies and gentlemen. Something to think about. Again, Stella, Dr. Stella Emanuel is who we're referencing here. Doctor, she got her doctorate in uh, Nigeria. and she. Uh, it's funny because I remember um, Anna Nicole Smith. Anna Nicole Smith famously said, may God rest her soul. Anna Nicole Smith famously said that she had sex with ghosts. And she had sex with, uh, I don't think she said demons, but, uh, but it was definitely ghosts. I, I'm kind of, I'm kind of iffy on ghosts, to be honest. I'm kind of, like, ghosts are a weird thing to me, right? Like, let's say you die, and how do you choose to be a ghost? How does that happen? You always hear about like heaven or hell or purgatory, but how are some people ghosts? And how are some people just like there's a big difference between being a ghost and being a real scary like amiable horror ghost who's killing people and murdering families and you know doing all that kind of stuff. And then there's a difference between like being Ron Jeremy basically of the astral plane and just having sex with sleeping women. Like what the hell is this? We where does that fall into it? How does that happen? It's hard to believe in everything, you know. Now, I, I do think, I, I, see, I believe in aliens. I just don't know if I believe in ghosts. And then if they are a ghost, it's like, how much of a ghost are you? You know, can you pick stuff up? Are you just like a spooky Casper-looking ghost? Or are you just a human who's 
kind of in a ghost form. I mean, I don't know. I mean, we, like we we see ghosts in Miss Pac Man, and they're just blue, look kind of like pillow sheets. But it's hard to imagine a pillow sheet thing, you know, having sex with someone in like some astral plane. So if they're just like a human, how does that work? How long can you be a ghost? There's a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions about being a ghost. Can you have ghost babies? Is it just a cycle? Of, I mean, how, where does the cycle end? Very, very weird situation. So hopefully Dr. Uh, Stella Emanuel can, can give us some answers. But with the current climate, I would not be surprised at all if um, she's 100% correct. I don't know. I wouldn't put anything past her. But I do want to know the answers. And I think it's crazy that people are like, but hydroxychloroquine. It's like, well, did you not hear the other thing she said? She said this, this is a cure for COVID. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just the flu. Don't worry about it. What the hell was she talking about with the demon semen? I don't know. Maybe, you know, different headlines for different folks. But I, I needed an interview with her on that second part, much less than the first part. Guys, can we talk about our presenting sponsor for the show, Matt Card, Matt Card, Anderson & Associates, PLLC? Can you imagine? Can you imagine getting into a car accident? Can you imagine termites destroying your home? Can you imagine coming home to a pile of ashes where your house once stood? You need answers. You need security. You need to make sure your family is taken care of. Who do you call? i tell you who you call. The good folks at Matt Card, Matt Card, Anderson & Associates, PLLC, 601-450-1715, or go to their website, MacHardLaw.com, M-C-H-A-R-D-L-A-W.com. But can you imagine not doing that and saying, oh, I know what I need to do. I need to go down the street three blocks to that billboard in the bad part of town. And I'm going to call that clay-faced caricature of a human being. I'm going to call him. And he's going to give me one call, that's all. Or if I'm lucky, he's going to give me one click, that's it, on his busted-ass website. Or I'm going to call and some intern, fresh out of law school, maybe, is going to answer the phone and give me 15 minutes or less to get my entire future solved. This is not difficult, guys. We talk about this every single week. First of all, the guy on the billboard, he's not answering your call. He ain't doing nothing for you. He will never hear your name. But he's going to be in the commercial. He's going to be driving the Lamborghini. He's going to be flying first class. He's going to be sitting courtside. You know what you're going to be doing? Eating off food stamps. You know what you're going to be doing? Crawling around because your legs don't work anymore because you got T-boned from some drunk driver. And what did you get? You might get a co-starring role in his next commercial. But what you actually want it's some security. What you actually want is some, some the ability to lay your head down at night and say, I did what's right for my family. Let me just read some stuff for you here. Car wrecks, 18-wheeler collisions, wrongful death, bad faith insurance claims, fire loss, termite damage, offshore injuries, employment discrimination, and contract business disputes. Do not negotiate your own. Do not litigate yourself. My friends at MacCard, MacCard, Anderson & Associates, PLLC, will help negotiate on your behalf and litigate your case if necessary. How special is this group of people? They will take your intake. They will take your information. They will help you. They will sit down. They will figure out what your situation is for free. They will not tack that on to your 15 minutes or less. Do not resolve your family's future to a one click. That's it. The only time you should be doing anything in one click on the internet is if you're ordering pizza. And sometimes that takes two clicks depending on the specials. Again, MacCard, MacCard, Anderson & Associates, PLLC, 601-450-1715, or MacCardLaw.com, M-C-H-A-R-D-L-A-W.com, Hattiesburg, Mississippi-based, trusted by us and the presenting sponsor to the greatest podcast on the internet. Hey, you want to hear some sports stuff? We're going to talk about some sports stuff? Sure. Sports have started. Yeah, sports have started. Baseball, back. NBA, starting tomorrow, actually, when, when we were recording this, so almost back. Soccer, back. It's all back, and it's all good news, right? Kind of, kind of, except for uh, multiple coronavirus cases, except for players leaving the bubble, except for some stuff like that. Besides that, though, we're all good. Before we get to the actual coronavirus cases in Major League Baseball, let's talk about Lou Williams. Lou Williams is a player for the uh, the Los Angeles Clippers. 
And the way the NBA is doing this is they're sending all their players to a bubble. In the bubble, you get tested, you get sent to the bubble. You can't leave the bubble. Can't leave the bubble. And then you stay there, you play the games, they play their tournament kind of thing, their season slash playoffs, and we're all good good to go. So Lou Will gets uh, gets on over there, and he's I think he's been in the NFL uh, NBA for like 15 years. But he gets over there, and he leaves. And he's seen on Jack Harlow, on Jack Harlow's uh, Twitter or Instagram or whatever. You know Jack Harlow, he sings the song What's Poppin'. And Jack Harlow and him are not in the bubble. There's a lot of questions. First question is, what the hell is Jack Harlow doing in the bubble? Second question, that bubble looks like a strip club. It is a strip club. Magic City uh, is the Atlanta strip club Magic City. So Lou Will got in a little bit of trouble because he went to the strip club and now he's placed on a 10-day quarantine and people are pissed. People are like, dude, how, how in the world... Could you go to this bubble, and how could you leave to go to a strip club? You can't contain yourself enough. You have to go to a strip club? So people were upset. But he has an excuse. He says, hey, I wasn't partying, okay? I wasn't out there partying. I wasn't doing anything like that. I wasn't being crazy. I was just getting dinner. People look confused. Dinner? What do you mean? Lou Will claims that he was at Magic City... Because he was getting dinner. Because those hot wings are his favorite thing to eat. And people were a little confused. People, number one, had no clue that strip clubs even had food. And two, had no clue they were good. So then pictures started popping up all over the internet of these wings. And I'm not going to lie to you, they looked incredible. Now this begs a couple questions to me. I always thought it was weird. I've heard this story before. Now you're going to say, James, have you ever been to a strip club? We don't have to talk about that. Yes, I have. And I've never eaten at a strip club. Because I, as you all know if you listen to this podcast, am not a fan of hibachi. I'm not a fan of table-side entertainment. I like to eat my dinner. I like to you know, have my own thing going on. I don't want to catch an egg off my face. I don't want some man doing an onion choo-choo train across my table. I don't want someone slinging rice at me. Not interesting. I'm not a circus clown. Okay. I just want my fried rice. I want my teriyaki chicken. I don't want to catch half of my teriyaki chicken being hurled to me through the air. Not interested in that. Same with this. If I'm in a strip club, I'm locked and loaded at the strip club. I'm drinking, whatever. I don't want to be involving hot wings into that. I don't want to be involving chicken tenders. I, I, I'm a. I don't even like my food to touch at buffets. I don't even like food to touch on my plate. If I've got... At buffets, I don't even like other... Like, I make my plates themed. If I'm at a buffet, I'm going to do... Oh, this is my pasta. This is my Italian-themed plate. This is my Asian-themed plate. This is my Texas barbecue-themed plate. This is my fried plate. This is vegetables. I don't even like stuff touching. Much less watching a dancer or whatever and eating hot wings... Have my dollar bills over here, drinks over here, people over the place is dark. That's a lot of bad. That's a lot of bad. I don't really get it. And something else you see nowadays is this drag queen brunch. This drag queen brunch situation has gotten out of control. Now look, a huge fan of both drag queens and brunches. I love brunch. Brunch is one of my favorite things in the world. I love Eggs Benedict. I like chicken and waffles. I love Bloody Marys. I love mimosas. I love poinsettias. I like it all. Drag queens, don't affect me. Hey, live your life. Don't care. Do you. Combining them, a lot. A lot to me. Now, controversial yet brave statement, but I think the drag queen brunch has slowly turned into kind of like the basic white girl's version of hibachi. Remember whenever you were like 13, 14, 15 years old, and for your birthday, you and seven or eight friends went to hibachi. And it was a clappy, clappy fun time. They spelled your name in the fried rice. Happy birthday, whatever your name is. Right there in the fried rice. You caught the egg. Or maybe didn't catch the egg. Who knows? Your friend got to spray the, the whatever, the oil that made the fire shoot up. Your grandmother's eyebrows were singed. Oh, what a fun time. I feel like that was the 90s. That was the mid-90s. And then hibachi got kind of played out. The, the chefs stopped caring as much. 
Some people hate a hibachi chef that doesn't talk, a hibachi chef that just does whatever they want to do. I love that. When I get to a hibachi chef who I know has had a really bad day, oh, I love it. I'm so happy. If I get to a table and the hibachi chef has his head down and he's just kind of chopping away and no one is getting hit with, with flying shrimp, I'm the happiest guy there. If I get there and he's, he's basically David Copperfield playing for a sold-out show in Vegas, I don't like that at all. Not a fan. So I think the drag queen brunches have now taken this one step further. But I'll say this. I feel like the drag queen brunches do not offer the same pump, do not offer the same kind of value as hibachi. I'm not even sure what you get. I feel like you just are having brunch, and they're just kind of like walking around you. It's kind of like having breakfast at Cinderella's castle. Cinderella's not cooking the breakfast. If Cinderella was walking around with an omelet maker or walking around with table-side waffles, hey, that's value. But these... Uh, Disney princesses and these drag queens, these br these brunches, they're just getting a free ride. They're just walking and talking and dancing and, and attacking people. Every time I see one of these things, someone's trying to eat their brunch, and one of the drag queens is you know giving them a lap dance in front of their in front of their eggs Benedict, or they're flipping them over in a chair. Or it, or hell, it's almost like a damn wrestling show. Same with same with these Disney princesses. Every time I see a video from Cinderella's castle. It's some seven-year-old girl trying to trying to enjoy scrambled eggs, and Snow White won't quit asking her questions. Look, Snow White, I only have so much time to eat these eggs, okay? Can I talk to you in two seconds? At least cook. That's what I'm saying. Disney princesses, at least cook. Drag queen, do something. The hibachi chefs are getting pushed out of the industry for absolutely no reason. Now, back to the Lou Williams story. Do not judge a place... For its food, until you've had the food. Especially wings. We hear a lot of wing snobs nowadays because of places like Wingstop, Wing Zone, wherever, that just do wings. Buffalo Wild Wings, uh, you know, not, not so much Hooters. Places that specialize in wings. But I'll tell you this. Do not judge a wing by its cover until you have been basted in that sauce. I'll tell you right now. Currently, and I would consider myself a bit of a wing connoisseur, Currently, my favorite wings are from Pizza Hut. You heard me here first. I think Pizza Hut right now has the best wings in the game. Pizza Hut. Not Wing Hut. Pizza Hut. You go to Pizza Hut, you get some wings that are huge, they're plump, their sauces are delicious. Buffalo Wild Wings could learn a thing or two from Pizza Hut. So could Magic City, could this strip club have incredible wings? I don't see why not. Do not judge Lou Will until you yourself have gone to Magic City and got their wings. $15 will get you their wings, and I'm assuming you have to play or pay in $1 bills. So Lou Will, I hear you, man. Everybody wants a solid dinner, and if his favorite restaurant in the city is Magic City, at least give the man what he wants. Now, I think takeout probably would have been the way to go here. I would imagine a Postmate or, or, or Uber uh, Uber Eats would have been quite expensive to go into the strip club, pay the cover charge, get the one free drink. If you've never been to a strip club, that's how most of them do it. They tell you, hey, it's 20 bucks cover, but you get a free drink. And it's like, well, it's kind of free, kind of not free, but I digress. I'll pay the $20. So, you know, I don't blame them. Wing snobs out there, if you've had Magic City's wings, uh, let me know what you think about them. But it wouldn't surprise me at all. I love I love wings of all shapes and sizes. Domino's wings, um, soggy, disgusting, wet mess. Very different than every other wing. They're almost like gummy wings. They're almost like not even a... They have bones, but they're almost not even bones. Like if you accidentally bite into a Domino wing and eat the bone, not a big deal. They might be fake bones. They're almost like boneless wings that were shoved onto a bone or something. So different wings for different places. But and I like a good hot wing. You know, I want my. I, I like. I like to at least try a couple wings of their hot, like just hot buffalo sauce. You know, that's how I really test, and then I start to venture off into the actual flavors. So, but Lou Will, you do you, man. You do you with Magic City. Y'all get off Lou Will's back. Baseball, not so lucky. Baseball also started up, and baseball has been a bit of a shit show. So first of all, if you haven't watched the baseball game, I don't blame you. It's still baseball. 
But they are putting fake fans in the stands. And they're doing it one of two ways. The first way is cardboard cutouts. The second way is they're using the digitized fans from the baseball video games and putting them in there only for the shots of like the whole stadium. So if you're watching a game and you see the digitized fans, but then there's a, a hit and the camera swoops in and you're now watching the live play, you won't see the fans. And it sucks. It's really trippy. The worst than that are these cardboard fans. I would much rather watch a game with no fans than the cardboard fans. The cardboard fans are straight up Truman Show in your face. Watching a baseball game and having a whatever 500 to 1,000 cardboard cutouts smiling and laughing and catching fly balls in the outfield scares the shit out of me. I hate it. I do not like it at all. I don't mind the fake noise. I don't mind them pumping in crowd noise. It's kind of whatever. It kind of gives like a good background noise. Like it, it is what it is. But I do not like at all looking into the stands and seeing a poorly cut out like generic man number one eating a hot dog behind a home plate for the entire game. That's the thing about these cardboard cutouts. They don't do anything. So if you've got a guy behind home plate eating a hot dog, you're going to be looking at him almost eating that hot dog for about four hours. You know, like that's the big thing with these cardboard cutouts is they're just they're okay for like a picture, or they're okay for a replay. But watching an entire game like that, I hate it, man. It, it it scares me to death. It is like the end of the world. It looks like what would happen if you were in a movie where a third of the population vanished. And you just like continued like nothing happened. That's what you would see. You'd see cardboard cut out people just living living in places. It, it's not it's not fun. But baseball had a, has a problem where so baseball is not doing the bubble. Baseball is playing division games, and then they're traveling to only close regional teams. But they're still traveling. So they're still going on planes. They're, they're still doing their whole thing. Buses, whatever, bikes, however they want to do it. But they're not bubbled. They're not centralized. And the Miami Marlins have had 18 players in the past like 24 hours pop for COVID. And most of them popped like the day after they already played a baseball game. So a lot of these questions, you're looking at it like, well, what do you do, right? Do you let the players play? Do you let the players, you know, the other players continue to play? Do you quarantine the entire team? If you quarantine an entire team for two weeks, do you, you know, make them or give them losses? Do you postpone their games? Do you disqualify them from the season? How do you do it? And it's kind of interesting that every other sport has said, "All right, we're bubbling." MLS, every team went to went to Florida. They went to the bubble. They played a tournament. They're out. Uh, basketball, they're literally living in a hotel, literally living in a bubble. Besides Lou Williams, and that's it. WNBA, same thing. And baseball decides, that sounds cool and all, but we're just going to do everything per normal. We're just going to cut the season in half. And it, it raises a question of, what is the right way to do this? Should we do it how baseball is doing it? And just say, well, if, if people test positive, we'll test them, we'll quarantine them, whatever. We'll move on. But we're not going to do the bubble thing. Or... Should teams and leagues say, look, we'll give y'all a product, but it's going to be a tournament, it's going to be a few weeks at a time, it's going to be in a bubble, it's going to be in one city, it's going to be no fans. How should they handle it? I think it's interesting because in, in these times of, sorry for the squeak, my chair, I got to get a new chair, man. I got to get a new chair. I've had this chair forever. I think right now in this time of total uncertainty, it's really easy to give like quick backlash. It's really easy to give like a quick, you know, oh, you screwed up. Oh, the Miami Marlins, 18 players pop, you're, you're screwed. It's really easy to do that. But I think in this situation, the proper way to do it is to step back, see what happens, and then judge, in this case, Major League Baseball, on their response. What will they do after this? I have a bad feeling that Major League Baseball is just going to turn a blind eye to the whole thing, and Major League Baseball is just going to kind of let it happen, and then you know just hope nothing else bad happens. I hope other leagues take a look at this and say well, we can't risk that. You know, like for college football, for example, if college football just played a normal season and one team had twenty players pop, well, 
Those 20 players are living on a university campus. Those 20 players will have to be quarantined. Does that team now, I mean, Major League Baseball has multiple minor leagues they can call players from. If the University of Michigan pops 20 players and they can't play or practice for two weeks, do you forfeit those games? Or they do you kick them? I mean, their, their season's over, right? So hopefully other leagues are taking this situation into account when preparing for what they're going to do. I think the way to do this is a combination of how the NBA is doing it and how Major League Soccer is doing it. So I like the idea of Major League Soccer doing a tournament because it's so quick. You're talking about like three, four weeks, and then then you're off, right? I also like the idea of there being a part of a season where the NBA is playing some, like, basically season games, and then they're going to get into their playoffs. I think it's somewhere in between there. I think it's somewhere in the middle of we're going to let games happen, but we're going to do this really short, quick process where, you know, Get some games in. Fans can see what they want to see. TV dollars can be met. All that responsibilities can happen. But we're not going to force these players to keep exposing themselves over and over and over again. Now, if you're a player, I think you also have to really look at this. You know, I mean, there's a ton of players in baseball who are already opted out, and of course, fans are pissed off about that. But when you think about it, it's like, why would these players not? You know, like, a lot of these players are probably having having families and ha- you know have children like babies or they're just kind of starting off their life and most of these people are between the ages of 22 and 30 so for them to be looking at their millions of dollars and then to say maybe it's just better for me to stay home this season you know maybe it's just better for me not to do that is it better for me and my family i think that a lot and we'll talk about this in the final story coming up but i think right now a lot of and we talked about it last week where a lot of societal norms are no longer when those rules that have propped up society are gone, you really are kind of only playing by your own rules. What are your rules? You know, what are your personal rules? Are your personal rules to keep you safe, to keep your family safe? And if they are, you have to do what's right for you. And these leagues are going to be trying to meet, you know, the, the intersection here is the leagues are going to be trying to make economic decisions. And then the players are going to be living by their individual rules. So you're going to have this cross-section of what exists here in the economic world and then what exists for the players and the human safety. So it's going to be interesting to see. I I mean, I hate it for baseball because baseball is trying. You know, baseball said, hey, we'll do a 60-game season, cardboard cutout fans, digital fans, who gives a shit? And then they get 18 players on one team. So tough, tough look. Um, But... It's not so much as it happening right here in that bubble, no pun intended, of the Miami Marlins. It's more about how Major League Baseball will handle it as a whole, how they will respond to that event, which we don't know yet. I mean, this has only been a couple of days, so we're still waiting. We're kind of monitoring how baseball handles this, and that's going to be the real detector of, of their ability to kind of survive this quarantine. If they don't handle the Marlins situation well, and another, like the, the Phillies are already kind of starting to pop up some stuff. If other teams start to fall, if other teams start to pop 20 people here, 10 people here, 15 people here, and Major League Baseball has to re-cancel the season after a week and a half in, that is not going to be a good look and it's not going to sit well with the rest of the country. Which leads us into the last story. So the last story is about school. So school season is upon us. And the question is, like, what do we do? Do we send kids back to school? Do we send kids back to school in a hybridized learning environment? How exactly do we handle this? This is something where we have to really take a look at our society and what we are doing moving forward. I do not think the correct answer is, well, it's time to go to school. Send them all back to school. It's really hard for me to accept stuff like that. And it's not just with school. It's with work or with with anything. It's really hard to look at this climate and say, well, hey, we we gave it our our college try to, uh, you know, whatever, uh, flatten the curve, didn't work, get your ass back in school. It's like, well, yeah, how can you justify, though, you know, giving us two days off for a snowstorm or, or a week off for a hurricane But then we're in the middle of the biggest global pandemic of all time, and we're just going back to school. 
The numbers are obviously way worse. Right now is obviously way worse than whenever we took a month off, whatever it was, four months ago. So how are we justifying this? The way that I look at it is that it's a really, really good indicator of how poor the leadership is. The leadership, if they're just saying, ah, well, hey, it's August, send them back. Ah, well, let's get back to work. It's like, y'all are just kind of flying by the seat of your pants, aren't you? Is there any real guidance here? Is there any real ideas? Is there any real opinion? Is there any real structure? Or is this just a flip a coin situation? And if it is, which it probably is, then you have to really look at everything around you and say, okay, well, why am I playing by their rules? Why am I playing by this? What is behind this? Is this, is this just like a fake, like a house of cards where they're saying, yep, all right, everyone come back on Monday morning, 8 a.m. to uh, 4 p.m. every day. It's like, are those just words? Are they, are they just saying things to say them and then the next day it, the governor could say, oh, shut them down, and then we're shutting them down? I mean, I know, and now it's state by state. I know in Louisiana, uh, they're pushing schools back to, like, uh, I think past Labor Day. Uh, where I'm at in Mississippi, it's just full full bore ahead with, uh, with school. And that's another thing where the people who are hybridizing and the people who are saying, we're, we're doing a hybrid class where you can either go to school or you can do the online thing. Wouldn't that be a problem with the so, like with social classes? Wouldn't that behoove the rich or the well-off or the upper class who have computers and high-speed internet and multiple you know uh, ten, like multiple screens, whether it's an iPad or a computer or whatever? Wouldn't that benefit them greatly? that they could do their schooling in their own home with maybe even their parent available versus this, the low income or the working class who don't have a choice, who have to go to the school or are trying to do the online learning via uh, old you know, old technology or with no internet or off, off LTE or something. I mean, at what point, like, wouldn't, wouldn't it just seem like in two years we're going to have just a ton of upper class kids who have 4.0s and then a bunch of middle class kids who do not. And yeah, they were being tested on the same material, but they were learning in a very different vacuum. I just think it's really weird that we're kind of going forward with this, but it's like the it's the ultimate short term thinking, in my opinion. I mean, it just seems like one of those things where it just seems dangerous. It just seems almost not right that we're just fracturing everything instead of making some blanket decisions here of okay, you know, maybe we should just push it to Labor Day. That seems to make sense for me, is you just push it back a little bit, push it back to Labor Day, and see what see what the situation is then. And if it's not, then maybe you go full hybridized, or maybe you go full workbooks, or, or you know, you figure something out. But this idea of, like, some kids are in the classroom, does the teacher want to be there? Is it safe for the teacher? Some kids are home. Who's doing their work? I mean, if I had a kid and my kid was in the first grade, and I came home from work, and they're trying to do some online test or some online learning, and I can just sit over their shoulder and help breeze them through it, I'm probably going to do that. And that's really unfair. It's really unfair. I mean, I, I remember when I, when I was taking the ACT, I knew someone who their parent came in and said, hey, my child has a learning disorder. He Can he take the ACT at home? I think, I, I'm not sure if he took it at home, or if they gave him extra time because it was like a reading problem. I can't remember what the situation was, but he basically was taking a very different test. I'm pretty sure he I'm pretty sure he didn't take the test under a time constraint or it was something like that. But it's a very different test. And all of a sudden now it's like, well, hold on a second. You know, like I had to go to school. I had to wake up. I had to go to the school. I had to learn from this teacher. You got to learn in the comfort of your own home with your parents there on a high speed whatever, $1,000 computer. There's a lot of households that don't have internet. I mean, I didn't have a computer. I mean, granted, it was different because the internet wasn't even around, but I didn't have a computer in my house until I was probably 15 years old, 14 years old, something like that. So, I mean, it's a different ball game. You know, some households are different. Some households, and even if you do have a computer, you know, maybe you're not proficient with it, and maybe you understand the, the learning, but you may not under, like I, I mean, if you've ever taken a, 
online class in college, sometimes just operating the software is a whole different thing. So I feel terrible for these students. I just think it's going to be bad. I really do. I think it's going to be bad for the learning. I think it's going to be bad for you know, kind of separating the classes. I think it's asking a lot of parents. And another thing, that's not even talking about the actual disease. That's not talking about the actual virus and schools being incubators. Schools literally being one of the worst places for disease because kids are so unruly and they're coming from multiple places, converging onto one place with no governance, no guidance. You can try as hard as you can, but you can't tell kids not to swipe the snot off their nose or not to touch each other or to wash their hands or whatever. And it's just... It's just not good. And the teachers, of course, are in danger. The staff are in danger. And those kids are going to come together, maybe pick up the virus, spread it to all these households. Those households are going to go back to their workplaces. They're going to spread it. It's just it's just one of those things where it's almost like common sense is failing here because people are just washing their hands of it. People are like, well, time to get back to normal. Nothing we can do. Woo! And then we're in the middle of the worst spike possible. And then you think back to four months ago, and it's like, well, what, what the hell happened? We, we shut down the country when there was 50 cases per state, and now that there's 50,000 cases per state, we're going back to normal? Is there a normal? Is this really normal? I mean, we're seeing now where people are saying, go back to school, but the kids had to wear a mask, the kids had to be six feet apart from each other, the kids can't go to the bathroom, the kids can't eat in the cafeteria. And it's like, oh man, are you just forcing this? Are people just forcing this because they feel like they have to be propped up by these norms that we've had for however long? Are people forcing going back to the workplace five days a week from eight to five because that's just the structure they know? Are people forcing a child to go to school in August because they just think, hey, it's August, they got to go to school? Shouldn't we be taking a step back and looking at this and saying, what do we need to do? What do we actually need to do to fix this? Not what have we always done. That's always the worst way to solve problems is to say, well, it's always been done like this, so we got to do it. It just doesn't make any sense. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like anyone's listening. Or I guess the worst part is it doesn't seem like anyone's thinking. It doesn't seem like anyone's really trying to explore what we should do. It's just a bunch of people saying, oh, well, this virus is created in China to whatever. Or these group of people saying, oh, we have demon semen situations over here but no one's sitting back and saying look guys should these kids actually be in a classroom should, should these teachers actually have to do this i mean I, I don't know i just think with technology now there's so many better ways to do this there's so many more proactive ways to do this and safer ways to do this but then again i'm talking about technology you know it's high tech stuff when people came to agree on a stupid ass mask so maybe at the end of the day it's all just a moot point because we can't agree on anything and nothing works. So I don't know. I mean, I, I, part of me wants to keep people safe and part of me wants to be as smart about this whole process as possible. But the other, other part of me wonders how long can you do that until, you know, how long can you do that when things are just getting worse? How long can we attempt to wear masks and shelter in place and quarantine when numbers are still skyrocketing? Is this just part? Is this just the new kind of half in, half out? Is that just the new world? Is that just where we are? Are schools just always now going to be this hybridized kind of like, yeah, yeah? If you feel like you know, if you feel safe, come on in there. If not, don't. But I don't know. I mean, I just, I just have a really bad feeling about this. I, and, and what do you do? What do you do if you open schools back up and the second week of school there's 30 cases in in the school? What the hell do you do? You quarantine all those kids, and then all those parents have to quarantine, and then you got to shut down the school, and then you got to start all over again. It just doesn't seem good. It's a rabbit hole. We talk about it every week. I hate it, and I hate that we're not just combating a virus that we have no idea about. We're not just combating uh, societal norms being shattered every single day. We're also combating this insane rhetoric of these conspiracy theories and these uh, it, it's just it's just a mess from every different angle. But we've gone well over an hour now, I think, on the show. So we will end the podcast, guys. We talked about a lot of stuff. That was a lot of different, a lot of different things. Magic City hot wings to demon semen to kids in school to to everything. I mean, we were 
we were all over the shop. So thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a fantastic rest of your week. We're recording this on a Wednesday, so this will go out on a Thursday. So happy Thursday. Uh, enjoy your week, guys. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. Go get you some hot wings. I might have some hot wings tonight. Not from Magic City. Probably from Pizza Hut. Guys, enjoy it. This has been the James Cometa Show.